Okay, so what we're going, just a little bit about shop floor automations. We um, are actually celebrating our 20th year in business this year. Um, founded in 1998, we are a manufacturing integrator. We work with different software and hardware packages to help customers increase productivity. And so today, we're going to, of course, be talking about machine monitoring and how that can help you with your productivity. Um, our company does provide uh, full sales, installation, and support services for all of the products that we offer. And then just a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Today we are going to be talking, of course, about how we collect data from your equipment. That is one of the first questions most people ask me is, how do you get this data? So we're going to cover that in depth. Um, we'll, another topic will be how machinists or operators on the shop floor can provide you feedback and enter data into the system as well. So data doesn't just come from your equipment, it can come from your people. And then I'll show you some examples of how you can view that data once we've collected it within our software, what kind of charts and reports and dashboards that you can see. And then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about how the software is configured, the different options, and um, just very briefly go into the pricing. So our first method of data collection we're going to talk about is Ethernet-based data collection. This is um, available on a lot of newer equipment, and there's really three main focuses for Ethernet-based data collection, and they are MT Connect, SANIC Focus, and OPC, more specifically OPC UA. So I will talk about each of those a little bit in depth. MT Connect's the first one we're gonna address. A lot of people have heard about MT Connect. It's a big buzzword out there, but really what is it? So oh, MT Connect is an open source protocol that allows machines to provide data in a standardized format for software applications like ourselves to be able to pick up that data from the machine. And there's two main components to MT Connect. And they are both pieces of software. So there's what's called the adapter, the software adapter, that actually pulls the data out of your machine. And then there's a agent, an MT Connect agent, that formats that data into the readable MT Connect standard that our software needs to be able to read. Um, and then once that data is collected, then of course our software package will display that data to you in an easy to read format. Some of the data points that are available with MT Connect, this is a partial list. There are many data points that are available. However, these are some of the most popular ones that machine tool builders provide and that we will collect. So things like what mode the control is in, um, is it in some kind of an emergency stop or an alarm? We can be given alarm specific codes as well. Uh, is there a load on the spindle? Are they um, turning the overrides on the spindle down? We could get part counts from a part counter. Uh, is it in a feed hold? That's really important to know. You know, if the machine's running and we know the spindle is turning, but if they have it in a feed hold, then that means that they're not actually cutting apart. So that could be information that's very valuable. Um, so different data points that we can pull, but there's quite a bit of detailed data that we can get through MT Connect. Now, MT Connect is supported by a lot of machine tool builders. This is just a partial list. Mazak was one of the first uh, to support MT Connect standard. They've been a big player in this. Whoops, excuse me. And um, DMG has now come on board, Makino, Akuma, there's quite a few others, but really the way that MT Connect gets expanded is by you, the customer, demanding that that is on newer equipment, talking to your machine tool builder, saying that we have to have this MT Connect in, uh, in order to run our business. So the MT Connect standard is being um, widely expanded based off customer demands. The next method 
of data collection is FANUC focus through an Ethernet port. This is proprietary to FANUC and more specifically proprietary to FANUC i-series controls. Now it's not available necessarily on all i-series controls, but most newer ones, things like 30, 31 i's, 20, 21 i's, um, standard on those. Older i-series controls, 18 i's, 16 i's, have a 50-50 shot of maybe having the um, focus installed. But basically, focus is extremely similar to MT Connect. It provides almost the same data points. Um, the data is fed directly across the Ethernet to our software, and our software has that protocol built in to be able to read and understand those, sig those signals coming from the machine. And the third, uh, Ethernet-based method of data collection is OPC UA. This typically falls into categories for like assembly equipment, fabrication machines, anything that is PLC driven. Those PLCs that are on the machines typically can support this OPC protocol and there are drivers that are readily available to allow that PLC to give us information about what's going on with the machine in the OPC protocol, which we can again read, capture, and then report for you. So those are the main Ethernet-based ways of collecting data. For any legacy equipment or older or manual machines that don't have those Ethernet technology built in, we have a hardware device that we can use. So what we use is called the status relay controller. It's this white box in the picture here. That is used to interface with electrical signals on the machine to be able to determine if that machine is running or not running. So an example would be maybe your machine has stack lights on it. And there is some logic built into what turns those stack lights on or off or green or red. And we could just tap into those lights and piggyback off that logic and then feed those signals back to our software and then decide, hey, you know, if these things are happening, then that means the machine is running. If you don't have stack lights, we can identify other points. Maybe it's a... Um, a spindle motor, maybe it's an on-off button, uh, some other switch or a sensor that's already built into your machine. Uh, this device, we can provide services to go through your electrical diagrams and find the wiring points and wire those in for you. Or you can have your own maintenance personnel um, identify those points and wire in relays and amp clamps and such to feedback. So it allows it's a lot less data that you than you can get sometimes from you know MT Connect or FANUC Focus or those Ethernet-based protocols, but it still gives you a lot of valuable information as to when that machine is running, and it allows you to hook up your older pieces of equipment. Now, in this picture, I just want to point out there there are actually two components. So you've got the device, the SRC white box here, and then there's a serial cable that's going into this device over here. So this is available in a wired or a wireless connection, um, but this is just converting that serial signal to an Ethernet signal and then relaying it back to the network. Uh, you can also use this in conjunction. We can have a second serial port available, so we can use it in conjunction with the DNC system as well. Now, the next method of getting data into the system I want to talk about is our manual data entry. This is where we can put a t PC or a tablet out on the shop floor and give your operators the interface to be able to enter downtime reasons that the machine can't tell us. One of the biggest value of this system is understanding when the machines are not running, why are they not running? And the machine can't always tell us why. We do have to have a human tell us why sometimes, and that's where this interface comes in. So it can be supported on uh, any type of uh, tablet, iPad, Android, or Windows. We have applications for all. 
From here, I'm going to actually jump into the software and we're going to look at this specific part of the software right now. Okay, so we've got, I'm going to explain what we're looking at here, but this data entry screen, I have it currently set up to show a couple different machines. I've got four machines set up here on the bottom. Each machine has a different color, and those colors relate to the status of the current, uh, current status of the machine. So um, you get to define the colors, but we're going to look at a couple of these. Like right now, I'm highlighted on the Haas machine. So the Haas machine is yellow, and in our system, yellow means unknown downtime. It just means the machine isn't running, and the machine didn't tell us why, and a human hasn't told us why. So we just know it's not running. And I can see how long it's been in that status. It's been in that status for 12 minutes. Um, then just basically any machine that I want to control, I would highlight that machine. And let's just say this machine was going to go into a downtime. I've got two categories of downtimes. I have unplanned or planned downtimes. You get to create your list of reason codes under each of those two categories. And the reason we do two categories is because sometimes with reporting, you may want to exclude one or the other. Unplanned downtime, like maybe I'm having a maintenance issue. So if I were the operator and I needed to put this into a downtime called maintenance, I would just highlight that, make sure I'm on the correct machine, do so on, and hit start new status. And instantly, it changes the color and it updates my status to say maintenance and it tells me how long I've been in that status. So it's that easy for the operators. And then we can build rules in the background to say, Okay, it's in a downtime right now. Um, either they could manually have to go in and end this status, or the machine running could just automatically end the status for them. And for different downtime reasons, you may want different rules. Like, for instance, right now, I'm in a downtime of maintenance. Well, I might not want, if the machine runs, I might not want it to automatically kick it out of that downtime, because as a maintenance person, I may have to cycle that machine a few times in order to uh, make sure that it's working properly. So for the maintenance downtime, I may want to force them to come over here and physically end it, but maybe something like um, a programming issue or a quality issue, I just might want them, if the machine starts running, for it to automatically kick it out of that downtime. Plan downtimes, you can see we have a couple defined in here. Again, you get to define what those are. The in cycle button, now typically, the in cycle button would usually be hidden uh, because we're getting cycle information directly from your machines nine times out of ten. But for instance, maybe you have a manual process that you want to track that there's nothing physically to connect to. You could use this in a manual way and just say, hey, you know, I'm starting a manual process, I'm ending a manual process. You can track things like part numbers. Again, typically the machine doesn't know the part number that it's cutting. Um, there are some possibilities within G-code and with variables and such that we could read it from the machine itself, but m more often than not, the machine only knows the name of the file. It doesn't know the part number, so you could manually uh, have them click on and enter a part number into the system, so that way everything that happens during that status, uh, during that part run will be counted towards that part. So if there's runtime, downtime, et cetera, it all gets counted towards that part number. Good parts, uh, again, typically we could read a part counter from a machine, but if we couldn't or it was the older legacy machine, they could annually, manually enter in their part counts. Same with scrap, you can manually enter scrap counts and you can manually enter scrap reason codes user defined, you pick the reason codes. And you'll also notice, actually on a lot of these um, choices, you'll see this notes box down here. So this note box gives the operator the ability to give some further information, whether it's about a scrap or a downtime. So if he wanted to type something uh, as to why the part cracked, there was a bad tool. Um, he could enter that in the system, and it will not only 
keep track of the reason, but it will keep the notes as a historical record, and it could also be displayed in a dashboard as well. Custom commands um, are exactly that. There are ways that we can add some different functionality into the system, like I set up a few examples here. Um, email maintenance. So if I'm running the DUSON, go on the EDM here. If I'm running the EDM, for instance, and I want to send an email, um, I don't necessarily have to have email even set up on my PC or my tablet. I just have to have this set up because it's going to have a pre-canned email in the background that will already say it's coming from the EDM and it will just say email a list of maintenance personnel or a generic email address that you've set up in the system and then they could type additional notes to give specific information to the maintenance department about what's going on with the machine. So this is a way to let them email without having to give them email capabilities. Another way we've used custom commands for some uh, customers is by putting a secondary status up on a dashboard. So let's just say, um, you know, my EDM right now is running, it's green. But I know that I'm going to need some material soon because I'm getting low. So maybe I wanted to just not change the status of the machine, but put a display up on a dashboard to show, hey, I'm going to need some material. And it could also even generate an email to somebody in the background automatically. And we'll come back to this later when we look at the dashboard. So just remember about this need material soon. Users self-explanatory, you can just log in which user is working on that machine at that particular time. So that completes the topic of the data entry screen. Um, I haven't seen any questions pop up yet on the chat window regarding that, so I'm going to keep moving forward. Um, okay, hold on. Nope, there we go. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. And the next topic we're going to talk about is our dashboards or our real time viewer. This is where you're going to be able to display your data in real time for everybody to see. Um, making it visible is something that our customers have reported to us helps to increase productivity right off the bat. Just knowing that this is displayed can change the behavior on the shop floor and you can start to see an increase anywhere from 5 to 20 percent by not even doing anything else but just displaying the data. So we're going to go into the software and show you that portion of it. So we have a tab here called RTV, pop over here. And I'm just going to show you some different examples of how you could display this data. There are a lot of different ways to display it. We won't go through all of them right now, but we'll go through a few highlights. First here on the left, I have a timeline view. It is an eight hour timeline. So right now at the top is current time pacific it's 10 20 and at the bottom is the beginning of the day so i can see very clearly when and what time of day different events happened so none of the machines were running it looks like until around 4 30 a.m and then i can see like on this makino it was green so it was running it was yellow then it was in this uh, downtime the legend over here shows me that that's a programming issue, but then it was running, not running, running, not running. It looks like it was clocking along at a normal pace for that particular job. Um, so nothing out of the ordinary except for this downtime in the morning. So it gives you some visibility as to what's going on. Up here in the top right, this is our target utilization. So in the background of the system, you can set up targets as to how much time you think the machine should be running. Just what percentage of the day do you think it should actually be cutting parts and running? It's an arbitrary 
percentage that you choose. It's not how what percentage of the time your parts should be running, just the machine itself. What are you shooting for? So like on this Akuma here, we've set up a target of 50%. I think it should be running 50% of the day. So as the day goes on, I'm going to see this bar right above it grow to see how close I'm getting to that target. And the bar is going to change colors as I'm far away from the target. It'll be red. As I'm getting closer, it'll be yellow. And then as I get really closer on target, <clears throat> it'll turn green. So it's a good tool to see where you're actually at versus where you think you're at. Down at the bottom, uh, this is a really nice option here. We can take a drawing of your shop floor, just import it into our system, and then we could trace around the drawing and highlight the machines with the colors of the current status of that machine. Another view just to look at, um, same shop floor layout, but with a 3D drawing, and there's additional text that we've entered down here. There's a lot of information you could put, but I've just put what the name of the machine is, the current status, and how long it's been in that current status. Again, I've got the timeline view here, and at the bottom, I've got the grid. This is actually one of my favorite views because it's very clear and easy to read. It just shows you current, current piece of equipment, what status it's in, how long it's been in that status. In this example, I've got part numbers, good part counts. If I'm not tracking part numbers, I could hide those columns. There's about 15 different columns that I could show instead in this view. But it's just very clear and concise and easy to read, especially from a long distance. A couple others will go through uh, downtime views. This one's kind of neat. In this regard, we have just looking at downtimes only, not anything about the cycle time or runtime on the machine, just downtimes. So maybe you would have something like this in a maintenance department where you could see, uh, like, really it would just be populated and it would only show machines that are in some sort of a downtime. Um, you could see a summary over the last 24 hours, what have been all my big downtimes. And then we can Pareto the downtimes too. So over the last 24 hours, what has been my heavy hitters? Quality seems to be my biggest issue over the last 24 hours. So that's an area I need to look into. Also, we have OEE views. So if you are looking to track full OEE, we can show that in real time and also in report forms. Um, it's just two different ways to show OEE data. On the top view, your uh, OEE target are the little dots, and then you've got your, uh, your three um, metrics for OEE, availability, performance, and quality, and then those three combined give you your overall OEE number. Same down here, just in a grid format. I like this one. It's uh, very clear and concise, but shows what my availability, performance, quality, and my overall OEE number per machine. And at the top here, it's actually summarizing all of the machines together in your total OEE for all of them combined. And you can have an unlimited number of these screens created. You can create them with whatever machines you want to show. Maybe you have a certain cell of machines. You want to put a TV over, so you only want to show those cell of machines on that TV and a different cell of machines on a different TV. Completely configurable for yourself. Um, and it could just be one screen, like this one here, is just showing me the grid view. And then remember back when we were doing the data entry screen and I did that custom command on the EDM to say, I want, I need material soon. This is just an example of how that would show up on a dashboard. So it doesn't affect the current status because that machine is still cycling, but it just gives a way to flag or provide some additional information about that machine. Great. So the next place we're going to cover and next topic are going to be reports. So these are everything we've looked at so far with those dashboards are real-time views. What's going on right now? What's happening on the shop floor currently? 
but the reports and the charts let you run that data historically. We'll just start with a detail report. So with the reports and charts, all of them have the same uh, selector here. We have a quick selector, just picked today, last week, this week. We have um, custom, you could do any custom date and specific time range. You can run the reports based off of specific shifts. You get to choose which machines you want to report on. I'm just going to pick all of my machines. So this just gives me a, a brief detail, so like the EDM we'll look at here. So for last week, which I ran this report for, it's going to show me how often I ran. So I was running for 24 hours for the last week, which was 29% of my week. I was in an unknown downtime for 45 hours, and these are the planned downtimes and the unplanned downtimes that I was in. So you could just get a high level view as to what your different downtime reasons are. Uh, summary view breaks it down even easier. So we've got four high level categories or statuses for all machines in the system. All machines are always going to be in one of these four states. They're going to be in some sort of cycle time some sort of unknown downtime, planned downtime, or unplanned downtime. So instead of breaking it down by specific reason codes, this just puts it into my four high-level categories. Now, when you run each report or chart, uh, you've got the ability to save that off as a PDF. With the reports, because they're text-based, you have the ability to export it out to different file formats, Excel, CSV, etc. So this will export the results of this report that you ran. If you would like to get to the raw data and run some reports, you can do it from up here. Well, this will give you raw data from the database over a period of time and export it. So you could take it to, uh, to manipulate it even further. Um, run different reports or use the data however you'd like. And just one more we'll run here. We'll run an operation time report and then we'll jump over to charts. Uh, this one has to do with part numbers. So if we're, we're tracking part numbers, we can run some different reports on that. I'm just going to pick a couple machines and some part numbers to run this on. But I really like this report. This one's nice. So for each part number, it's going to break it down as to what piece of equipment, how many good parts, how many scrap parts, but also during that part run on that piece of equipment, what were your statuses? Did you have downtimes? Like, let's go down, here's one part number on this Makino, where while we were running that part number, we had some programming issues and some quality issues. So that obviously added to the bottom line of what that part profit was. So information that you can find out per part is very nice as well. Okay. Now I'm going to jump over to some charts. We'll just look at a couple of these. And we'll start with a summary chart. Everything's the same as with the reports. We just pick our machines, and we're just going to run it as is. This one is giving, I ran it for today, so this is just going to give me a summary of what's been happening for today. So each percentage of time, it was in each of those four high-level statuses we talked about. So like we have the Makino here, 24% um, cycle time, 64% unknown, 5% planned, and 7% unplanned. But if I want to break that down and see where the planned and unplanned came from, I can go back into my options. Oops, filter, not options. And I can hit the next button and say, show me specific statuses, not just my general statuses, but my specific statuses. So it's going to regenerate that same report, 
and now it's broken it down and it's showing me, okay, 5% of your time you're in breaks, 5% programming issue, 3% quality issue. And then when you want to see, well, what times of the day did those happen, you can take a look at that too. Um, but one thing I want to point out is over here on the cycle time, you'll notice it broke some of these machines down into two different types of cycle time. This is really important. Um, on a lot of traditional CNC type machines, you we can tell when it's empty connector focus based if the operator turns the feed rates down. In other words, running that program slower than what it was programmed to run at. We can set up a rule in the system to say, you know, still count it as cycle time because the machine is still actually running. Um, but just tell me if they're turning the feed rate down. So we set up a cycle time called low override. So we can see what percentage of the time they were running it slower than they were supposed to. So this Mori and this Mitsubishi both had some low override time. So if we want to see, well, when did that happen? What time of day did that happen? I can look at a timeline report to figure that out. So I'll do the timeline report on the same machines and the same data and we'll look at specific statuses. And so here's the Mori. You could see I had some low override time in the morning, then it was running at a normal cycle, then low override time. So I can see, I can tell what, what operator was working that day, who was working on it, and I can just, you know, go ask them some questions. Why were we running that at a lower speed? So it gives you some pretty valuable information. Now, on the three tabs we just looked at, charts, reports, and the, the real-time viewer, all of them have, over here on the left-hand side, this button called My Charts. All of them have Group Charts or it's my reports, group reports. But the idea there is maybe you've got your favorite report or chart that you like to run all the time. You can pre-set up all of the picks, what machines you're showing, what the, what the details are, um, the date range, et cetera. And then you can save that as like one of your favorites. And with the reports too, you can even have it set up where you automatically the system will automatically generate that report on a certain day and time and automatically email it to a user or a group of users. So that makes it pretty flexible. Okay. Now we're going to jump back over to our PowerPoint and we're going to talk about a few other items before it's time to finish up here. So now I'd like to cover how the software works. We really have two versions of it. So the first is our cloud-based version. This is a monthly subscription model. No servers for you to worry about maintaining, very limited IT support. Uh, all of the data is stored up in the cloud and you can access that data from anywhere. Doing the cloud-based model allows for a lot lower upfront cost because you don't have the servers to purchase. You don't have a flat uh, rate purchase price for the software. You're just doing a monthly subscription and you are paying per machine that you want to monitor. It's either a very good way to just start out with the system as a trial or to um, continue long-term. Most of our customers, do the monthly subscription. It is by far the most common. The other version is an on-premise version. This is like your traditional software model where it's a one-time purchase and um, you own the software just like with other software packages, there's a yearly maintenance fee that keeps you on the most current version. Uh, new updates do come out to this software at least four times a year. They're constantly enhancing the product, adding new features, adding new reports, and a lot of that is based off of your feedback. This is 
uh, has a little bit more support involved to it because your IT department will need to be involved. They do have to supply the database, they have to supply the server space, and they will have to automatically, or I mean manually, apply any updates to the software where with the cloud version it's all done automatically. Um, so there's a little more back-end work involved when you do the on-premise on version. But both are available, and both have the same functionality, same features. It's just one stores the data in a public cloud, and the other is really going to store the data in your own internal cloud. Okay. Um, then just a little bit about how it works is, Within your facility or your plant, you will have at least one PC. Sometimes there's multiple, but you'll have at least one PC or server that runs a service. That service is what's actually pulling all of your machines and collecting the data. It's important for you to know that the machines are not collect connected directly to the cloud. Okay. Everything is going through our service first. That's what's going to take the data. It's going to apply rules to the data. It's going to look and see, you know, is the machine running? Does it, what does the database say? We have all these rules that will run through the system first. Once it's processed the data, then it's going to take it and pass it up the cloud to the database or to your own internal database. You can have more than one service running. This usually only happens if you have a lot of machines. We have a customer with probably, I think, over 150 machines on the system. So they're running multiple services because you don't want necessarily one PC collecting the data from all those machines. And then a little bit about the different levels of the software that are available. There's three main levels, bronze, silver, and gold. Um, each one starts adding a little bit more functionality to it. There are a lot more features than what I'm showing in this chart here, but this is just some of the key functionality. But really what it boils down to, the easiest way to talk about this, is that bronze gives you running or not running. Are my machines running? You can get different types of run types. Like, like those two colored greens we looked at with the normal cycle and low override, you can get that with bronze. You just can't get downtimes. Every If the machine stops running, it's always going to just be considered an unknown downtime. You cannot enter downtime codes at all with the bronze. Silver is where you get to start adding your downtime codes. Gold is really where you get to start adding part numbers, part counts, and the other metrics that fall under OEE data collection. So the pricing here is per machine, per month, for each of the different levels. Once you hit 10 machines, you start to get discounts. For every additional machine that you add, you keep getting an additional discount. But that is the monthly fee per machine. There is a one-time account activation fee. Um, that's not on this slide. but. Uh, basically, to set up your account in the cloud, there is a small fee. It starts at $1,000 for bronze, it's $1,500 for silver, and it's $2,000 for gold. Um, but you, that's a one and done, uh, not a per machine. And then there, of course, can be additional costs in the background, like if you need to add hardware to your legacy machines, your on-site services for training and installing the software, um, and also there are some other costs that ne don't necessarily come through us, but maybe, for instance, like MT Connect. MT Connect might be capable to be added to one of your machines, but you may have to pay the uh, machine manufacturer to install it. And those costs vary from machine builder to machine builder. Um, that was a question that came up earlier. Uh, Mike, I think, had asked. Uh, how much does MT Connect cost? So it, it does vary from machine builder to machine builder. It can be a couple of hundred dollars to a couple thousand dollars because your control may have to have upgrades in addition to just having MT Connect installed. Okay. So that 
concludes, we're right almost at our 45 minute mark, but that concludes what I wanted to cover for you today. Uh, let me see if there are any other questions. Um, it looks like there might be one. Ah, can the system pull data from an ERP? What about multi-plant support? Okay, so first let's answer the first question. Can the system pull data from ERP? Yes, we can integrate with third-party systems. Uh, we use off-the-shelf APIs um, and some scripting as well to be able to integrate with your ERP. So we could either pull data from your ERP and we could even potentially send data to your ERP system. Very common question and common uh, request. What about multi-plant support is another question. Yes, the software does support multiple plants. When you break it down, when we look at like running, let's look at running a report again. We, you can see I actually have a hierarchy set up here. So I've got my main system, SciTech, and then I have a plant called Denver. So in theory, I could have multiple locations set up here. And then by permissions, different people might be able to view different stuff. Like maybe the corporate office can see all the different plants, but only the Denver plant can only see the Denver machines. So it is definitely capable of doing that. We even allow for translations within the software to change all of the, uh, the, the labels. So you could basically put those into another language. So if you have a plant in Mexico, everything could be changed to Spanish. And that way when those people log in, they would see all of the text in Spanish versus if you were in the US, you'd see it in English. Um, you, another question is, can you see the login to see the data remotely? Okay, good question. Yes, um, if you're using the cloud-based version, then this application to view the data can be installed anywhere on any PC. You just have to enter your credentials once and you're good to go. You could log in from anywhere to see it. There are also apps available for your cell phone to be able to view real-time data there. and Another question along the same lines was how many different users can access the data? There is an unlimited number of this reporting and charting tool that we've been looking at. There is no limit to this. Everybody in your company could have this installed on their computer. You literally just pay per machine. You're only paying per machine, whether it's the on-premise or the cloud version, and the application is unlimited. And then uh, the last question I've got here so far is, is there a trial available? Uh, the answer, the easy answer to that is yes. Um, we do offer a uh, free two-week trial. Uh, um, there is a actual small fee. I'll take that word free out of there. There's a small fee for some of our time to help configure it for you. But yes, you can do a two-week trial of the software. And we would want to take a look at your list of machines to see what else would be involved with that. And I think that's my last question so far, unless anyone else has any questions they would like to type in. Otherwise, I do want to thank everybody for joining today. I hope this was informative. Um, I will be sending out a follow-up email to everybody that attended. So um, if you would like to get more information, I'll be happy to speak with you one-on-one. -on -one. Thank you for, again for your time today, and I hope everybody has a good day.